Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I don't know if you can see me up here. I'm Councilman Bonin. Uh, welcome, everybody, here to our second town hall. Last week, uh, many of you, and from the looks of things, many others, gathered here for a town hall discussion about homelessness and housing and solutions to the homelessness crisis here in Los Angeles. And tonight, we're here tonight to talk about public safety and about neighborhood policing. So I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Our uh, format will be very similar to what it was last week. Uh, I'll do a, a brief presentation and then Captain Setzer, the commanding officer from uh, Pacific Area Command, will make a presentation about some of the crime stats and trends in Pacific Area and in Mar Vista. And uh, then our moderator, Jeff Mailman, will come out and introduce our panel. We'll do a bit of a, a panel discussion, and then we'll uh, go to questions directly from the floor. And uh, I think we'll have an opportunity to get to almost every question tonight, which will be great. So let me just start tonight um, with our, our, our topic. As I said, it's about public safety and neighborhood policing. And one of the most common things I hear from constituents is that they feel like they do not see a patrol car often enough. They feel as if it takes too long for a 911 call to be answered. And they often call and say, where are the, the police here in Los Angeles? And here in Los Angeles, as in many other places, people have a, a vision and a desire for community policing. People want to have an opportunity to have cops that they know in their neighborhood, uh, people who frequent their block parties, who uh, know their kids, who give a presentation at the schools, who walk a, a, a footbeat or ride a bike or, or, or drive a car down the streets and get to know a neighborhood so that they can know a neighborhood well enough not just to, to stop crime but to prevent it. And here in Los Angeles, uh, community policing has been something that has been the goal of LAPD and the city really since the late 1960s. Uh, the idea of uh, community policing in Los Angeles uh, started back in 1969 under Chief Ed Davis. After, after the, the Watts riots, uh, there was a push for more neighborhood-based policing. Uh, the same thing happened after the Christopher Commission report. The same thing happened after uh, the civil unrest of 1992. There has consistently been a push from two different segments of Los Angeles for more neighborhood policing. From neighborhoods on the west side that want to see more crime prevention, and from neighborhoods in, in South Los Angeles and other parts of the neighborhood that want to see cops that, that know their neighborhood as opposed to, to come in just to suppress crime. So in 1969, Davis uh, initiated this system. It's called the basic car system. And most of you know the basic car system is the geographic area in which your senior lead officer has responsibility. Uh, and there has been, over the years, a push and pull about giving LAPD enough resources to fully fund neighborhood patrols. Uh, back and forth through the, the, the 70s and 80s, there was a push and pull. Ed Davis, the police chief back then, was big into it. Daryl Gates tried to uh, rolled it back quite a bit. And then subsequent chiefs, Willie Williams, Bernie Parks, and others have, have begun to put it back. And as Chief Williams said in that quote we just saw, they always take from patrol uh, and put it somewhere else. And that was something that there have been headlines about and studies about saying that we need to put more of an emphasis on patrol. It's been literally decades of debate about this. And that debate didn't really result in any action. Uh, continually, we have had a de-emphasis of patrol here in Los Angeles. Uh, and the math ain't, ain't a very good, good one. I'm going to show you what has happened. In 1969, LA was under 3 million people. In 2016, it was over 4 million. In 69, we had about 6,200 sworn officers. In 2016, we had nearly 9,900 sworn officers. But look at this last column, how many in 1969 were actually on a, on a typical day assigned to patrol duty? 337. And then in, 19, in 2016, that number, even though the city was much larger and the department was much larger, there were actually fewer officers on patrol. So, 
Uh, for, for a number of different reasons. One, uh, starting with, Ch with Chief Gates, the department created a number of different specialized units. Also, during a number of years of lean budget times in the city, the city put the police department in a very uncomfortable position by eliminating a lot of civilian positions. And as a result, they had to use uniformed officers to be assigned to desk duty to do civilian jobs. So nothing had happened really to change this dynamic, despite a lot of talk for a while. So in 2017, I unveiled this, this push called Back to Basic Car, re-emphasizing patrol. I did it with a collection of residents and businesses, neighborhood officials, uh, and officers. And the push was to re-emphasize patrol. And it's actually finally started to, to, to pay off. Uh, working with Chief Beck and, and, uh, initially and then with Chief Moore, in January 2017, we, we launched the initiative. And they uh, immediately, within a few months, put 84 more officers on patrol. Then a few months after that, another 18 officers reassigned to patrol. Then in January of 2018, an additional 186 officers were reassigned to patrol. And a couple months after that, 90 officers were assigned to patrol. And then again, at the beginning of this year, an additional 200 officers were assigned to patrol, giving the LAPD, without hiring uh, any net new officers, an additional 578 addif additional officers on patrol. Largely, that was because we, g we gave them the ability to hire more civilians with an agreement to push more officers off desk duty and out into patrol. They also stopped doing some overnight front desk stuff in, in certain areas and pulled from some other specialized duties. So that net 578 new officers is, a, is an increase in patrol resources over the past two and a half years of 8.8%. That's, that's one of the biggest deployments we've had, deployment increases we've had in a while. It is still not enough to make a tangible difference to a lot of us. That 578 figure is citywide, not just here on the west side. Uh, so the, the next steps uh, in order to, to, to increase public safety resources. Chief Moore made a commitment to us during last year's budget process that if we on the city council continued to hire more civilians, clerks, analysts, the, the people who, who, who process the, the, the paperwork and stuff, he would over the next four years be able to redeploy an additional three or four hundred officers back out onto patrol duty, all without hiring any net new officers. And it's worth noting right now, LAPD at 10,100 officers is about as large as it has ever been and constitutes 53% of the discretionary budget of the city of Los Angeles. The other thing that we're doing to further advance this effort is we are doing what is called, it's a wonky term, it's a basic car boundary study. The last time the city drew the lines that, that your senior lead officers worked in and made patrol assignments was back in the, the early to mid 90s. It was before, for instance, Playa Vista existed before downtown, for instance, was a, was a thriving community. And the lines do not currently reflect population trends. So this new study, which my office has pushed, which is a requirement to redraw the lines, has been at our direction looking at some of the dynamics that need to be considered. Traffic patterns, the difference in daytime population, nighttime population, geographic isolation. And the results of that study will be coming in the next few months and will be a blueprint for how Chief Moore can do more neighborhood-based policing. Uh, along with that, uh, continuing to push for re reinvigoration of patrol and to do a couple things that the fire department does. Right now, if Captain Setzer, for instance, has an assignment of, just I'll pick a random number, 20 officers for a shift, and one of them is called to court, and another one calls in sick, those bodies often do not get filled, and he is operating two officers short for that day, which impacts patrol. In the fire department, that's not how they do it. In the fire department, if they have 10 people to a station, somebody calls in sick, someone gets called in, and they are never short a person. It's called constant staffing, and it's a concept we're trying to move the police department to as well. Uh, so uh, that wraps up my presentation, uh, giving a general overview of what we're doing for, to, to increase patrol officers. You know, it's the, the officers you're going to hear from tonight are the ones who do the actual enforcement. One of the biggest things I can do for, for neighborhood safety is make sure that there are enough resources and that they are allocated 
in the, the proper way and getting officers doing patrol duty and neighborhood community policing is, is one of the best ways we can do that. So with that, I am going to introduce uh, Captain James Setzer, who is the head of Pacific. Captain. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Let me get some light going here. I can't see my nose. Working under austere conditions. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. My name is Jim Setzer, and I'm the uh, Area Commanding Officer at uh, Pacific Station. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, crime, the 2019 crime picture in uh, Mar Vista. And uh, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, I am the Area Commanding Officer. My, uh, my co-pilots would be uh, Captain Brian Morrison, who oversees all patrol operations. And uh, we have a Detective uh, Commanding Officer, uh, Lieutenant Sam Roan, who oversees all the follow-up efforts and the filing efforts uh, once our officers go out and either make arrests or uh, request filings for different cases. A snapshot of Pacific area, I'll give you kind of a big overview of the whole area that I oversee and then we'll, we'll bring it right down to uh, specifically uh, the neighborhoods here in Mar Vista. Uh, Pacific itself is about 25 square miles total. We service about 250,000 people. Uh, the borders of Pacific uh, are roughly uh, the 10 freeway to the north in Santa Monica. On the east side, we have the 405, which would be uh, Culver City and uh, Inglewood to the east. Uh, to the south of Pacific, we have uh, El Segundo and uh, the Imperial Highway. And obviously on the west, we have the uh, beautiful Pacific Ocean. I think the council member talked a little bit about our staffing. Uh, we have roughly 300 sworn personnel assigned to uh, Pacific area, and that is uh, one of the bigger commands in the city, not the biggest, but one of them. Uh, in terms of basic car deployment, if you look at the, uh, that senior lead officer map over there, I'm not sure that came out quite as clear as I would like, but uh, you'll see eight pictures up there of individuals. Those are our eight senior lead officers, and the way we divide up uh, the neighborhoods and the geography of Pacific is we have uh, uh, one senior lead officer oversees each basic car. We run eight basic cars on a 24-hour basis, and uh, in, in amongst that, we have uh, three mid-watch units on two separate shifts. So uh, that's about 11, 11 two-officer units working uh, over 12-hour shifts. Okay. All right, uh, looking at the crime picture so far for Pacific, uh, 2019 versus 2018, as an area, uh, we are currently enjoying somewhat of a 2% reduction in overall part one crime. Uh, we've been challenged as an area with a, a rise in about 6.6% uh, in violent crime, and our property crimes are doing relatively well with a 3.3% 3, 3, uh, reduction. When we look specifically at uh, each of the part one crime categories, again, we're talking all of Pacific area. Uh, we have uh, four homicides year to date, and that's a 100% increase over 2018. Uh, I'm happy to say that none of those homicides occurred in Mar Vista. Two were gang-related down in the, the Oakwood area. Uh, one was uh, the result of family violence down in the marina. And one was uh, tragically a, a two-year-old victim of a homicide uh, from uh, later last year that didn't get classified till this year. Uh, sexual assaults are down 27%. Uh, robberies are down 1.7%. Our, like I said before, our aggravated assaults uh, have been a significant challenge for the area this year uh, with a rise of uh, over 17 percent, so which makes, brings us to our total violent, increase, total violent crime increase of 6.6 percent. Burglaries overall looking, looking pretty good with a 12 percent reduction year to date. Uh, our grand theft auto, which is stolen vehicles, uh, down 12 percent. Burglary theft from motor vehicles are down uh, almost 7 percent. Our theft category is up 5.9%, and that, is, uh, that doesn't look good because it's red, but that was double digits in the summertime, so we're uh, moving that number in the right direction. The total property crime reduction so far is 3.3%, uh, and as I mentioned in the first slide, uh, overall that's a part one crime reduction of 2.1% for the entire area. So now, let's talk about Mar Vista specifically. So, uh, 
Looking not too bad uh, with respect to the rest of the area. We, we do see a 19% increase in robberies, you know, but again, uh, these, these are relatively small numbers compared to what we saw looking at the entire area. Pacific area has 229 uh, robberies year to date, and uh, Mar Vista has 25, which is a, a rise of four crimes over last year, which is a 19% increase. And that, that really drives your uh, increase in violent crime to 4.2% uh, year to date in Mar Vista. Property crime, uh, and we'll talk about burglaries uh, more later, but uh, year to date we're looking pretty good, but I know there's a big uptick and we've got a lot of programs and investigative efforts trying to uh, combat the current rash of uh, residential burglaries we are experiencing. But year to date from our Vista, uh, down 16% 16, 16 in burglaries, uh, down 12% in, in uh, stolen vehicles, down 17% in burglary theft from motor vehicles, uh, thefts are down 6.9%, uh, total property is down 13 percent, and in terms of this basic car, which is a 25, uh, we're looking pretty good with an 11 percent reduction in Part 1 crime year to date. So now uh, we're going to move and look in the last 30 days in Mar Vista. And uh, as I said, uh, we'll, we'll kind of we'll combine uh, the violent crime. We'll look at uh, the robberies and aggravated assaults in the last 30 days. And by 30 days, I'm talking about the month of October. Uh, we've had five robberies and three aggravated assaults. Three of the robberies were Estes robberies. And an Estes robbery, if you don't know what that is, uh, that is a shoplift gone wrong. Uh, somebody goes in to take a bag of potato chips, and uh, they're confronted by the store clerk. Uh, there might be some kind of struggle or fight, and that, that's when a shoplift turns into a robbery. So three, three of those were Estes robberies, two were at Ralph's, and one was at a Rite Aid. And then we had two what I would call traditional street robberies. Uh, an individual approached a lady with a bottle and threatened her, and she gave up her cash. And uh, in another case, uh, we had a purse snatch in which the uh, victim put up a struggle, and that's when you bring in the force or fear of a uh, particular crime and that elevated that situation to a robbery. Aggravated assaults, we have uh, just had three in the month of October. We had an individual brandished a toy gun at a gardener and uh, he was arrested. Uh, we had another dis verbal dispute that got physical at a car wash. And then also we had a victim who was stabbed but became uncooperative with detectives and that case uh, stalled out and we're unable to proceed with that case. Now, looking at property crime, Mar Vista burglaries, and that's where uh, we're definitely taking on water in terms of the crime picture. Uh, for the month of October, there's been 14 residential uh, burglaries, and in the last week, we're gonna, we have to add another 10, so we're looking at 24 burglaries since October 1st. The top means of entry into the homes has been shattering the rear glass or the rear uh, slider windows, and also, unfortunately, uh, Opportunists are out there taking advantage of unlocked windows and unlocked doors uh, in the middle of the night and they sneak into different houses and steal property. Uh, the target of the property is, as you might guess, it's uh, jewelry, electronics, cash, it's anything small uh, that they can walk out of there with and uh, secrete and either run off into the night or jump into a getaway car. In terms of uh, strategies uh, that, are, that are worth considering, uh, we don't endorse any particular security company or uh, uh, or any kind of uh, agency or camera system, but, but believe me, uh, that is money well spent in terms of deterring crime and also giving us uh, leads to work on with our detectives. Uh, exterior lighting, flood lighting, motion, detective, uh, motion detection type lighting out outside the exterior of your house is also uh, a, worth, a worthy investment. Uh, I always recommend one last walk around at night before you go to bed. Uh, make sure that garage door is closed. Make sure any access into your home is, is locked and closed for the night, and especially if you're going away for the weekend. Uh, always be good neighbors. Uh, when you see suspicious vehicles, please make note of it. Uh, try to get a plate if you can, if it's safe. And then also, we do appreciate our detectives wanting me to pass along. I know uh, with this, this particular increase in residential burglaries, uh, a lot of you folks have been sharing uh, ring video and different security camera videos with our detectives and believe me, it might not help today, but over the course of time and over the course of the case, uh, we're able to combine information and get leads, uh, get plates and get partial uh, suspect descriptions. 
Looking at Mar Vista auto-related crimes, for the month of October, we had just uh, three stolen vehicles, but we did have three, uh, uh, 23 uh, burglary theft from motor vehicles. Uh, and of those, 34% uh, of the time, uh, car doors are left unlocked or windows are left ajar where somebody can reach inside. Uh, there's cases where people leave uh, valuables on the seat, uh, iPads, laptops, uh, you name it, on the back seat or the dash. And an opportunist has nothing, nothing better to do but to smash the window, reach inside, and grab those valuables. And then in 14% of the cases, uh, we did have uh, stolen license plates and catalytic converters. So uh, an ongoing message from the LAPD to everyone would be to uh, lock it, hide it, keep it. Uh, there's no such thing as I'm just going to run inside the house for a minute and either leave the car unlocked or some valuables inside. Uh, if you're going to be away from the vehicle, please put the valuables in the trunk uh, or just take them inside where they'll be a lot safer. Uh, in terms of holiday planning, uh, as we're all out shopping in, these, in the coming holiday, uh, coming holiday season, make sure you uh, put your stuff uh, away. Make sure you put it in the trunk if you can. Uh, if you're on extended shopping trip, please make sure the trunk is empty so you can put all your valuables uh, outside and out of, out of sight. And uh, I don't know, how many people in here own a Prius? Well, year to date, uh, the Prius and the Honda Element have been the primary focal points for stolen catalytic converters. And uh, we've had 62 uh, year to date, and a handful of those have come out of the Mar Vista area, and one as recently as last week. Uh, if you go to our Facebook page, there is a video on there that shows how quick these crews come in and steal uh, the catalytic converter. Uh, they literally will come in uh, three deep in a vehicle. Uh, one guy jumps out with a sawzall, another guy jumps out with, uh, with a jack, and in 25 seconds, literally, uh, they've got that vehicle up and the catalytic converter gone. And uh, there's enough uh, uh, unscrupulous uh, or recyclers out there that are willing to pay for that catalytic converter and also get that valuable metal uh, that they convert to cash. So, moving along to uh, our Vista thefts. Uh, we've had uh, 14 in the month of uh, October. Uh, six have been shoplifting, uh, three, of the, three stolen bicycles, and uh, two mail packages. Targeted property, uh, as you might guess from that list above, would be uh, shoplifting at different businesses, whether it's food or clothing, uh, bicycles, uh, year to date as an area. Uh, we've lost uh, 430 bicycles have been stolen. Uh, please, I know sometimes in different uh, neighborhoods in, the, in our area, some people give up reporting stolen bicycles. Uh, I would ask you to, if you have been a victim of a stolen bicycle, to please report that because. Uh, as those come in, we might not be able to find that bike that day, and frankly, we may not find that bike, but when we find clusters where different neighborhoods are targeted, uh, we're able to use a bait bike and some other uh, uh, strategies to uh, try to discourage that kind of uh, criminal activity. Uh, mail packages and uh, unattended property. Uh, mail packages, again, uh, part of the holiday planning. Uh, if you're going to have uh, New purchases delivered to your home and whatnot, please make arrangements. Either I think Amazon and some other uh, companies have other ways to uh, have a secure drop off uh, when you're having new, new, new valuables delivered to your home. And also, maybe if you have a neighbor that's home all the time, try to maybe see if they could uh, accept that delivery for you on your behalf and keep your property safe. Unattended property, uh, we've had a number of uh, cases uh, at, at shopping, uh, shopping centers and whatnot where uh, folks are out. Uh, maybe a, a lady leaves her purse open with the wallet inside. She turns around to uh, shop for whatever uh, whatever she's interested in, and uh, uh, the criminal element will will uh, prey upon that, and they'll reach into that purse when she's distracted and walk out with that purse or the wallet inside the purse. So again, uh, be mindful of your surroundings while you're out shopping. And again, uh, when it comes to thefts around your home, uh, bicycles or any kind of valuables you might have on your front porch. Again, uh, make sure that please make sure the garage door is closed and uh, make one more walk around your home at night before you go to bed. So moving on to uh, keeping in contact with the police and reporting crime. Uh, obviously, the, when you're reporting a crime in progress or a, a crime in general, uh, please use 911. Uh, if, it's a non, if you have a need non-emergency services, uh, MyLA311 is, uh, is a good resource. 
Pacific Station has been, we've been working very hard in the past year to expand our social media presence, if you will. Uh, we have 9,900 9, Facebook followers, uh, 60, over 63,000 uh, followers on uh, Nextdoor, uh, over 10,000 on Twitter, and 862 on Instagram. And also, I'll show you here shortly the, uh, a smartphone application uh, that's tied in directly, directly to uh, Pacific Station. Again, here's our uh, social media contacts. And uh, if, you, if you follow us on Facebook or any of the other accounts there, uh, you'll find crime alerts uh, uh, and uh, notices of community events. And also, it's a good place to uh, share information with the police department and uh, other folks that are also enjoying uh, social media. The Pacific Station application, uh, it is available to the public. You just go on uh, your, your, your favorite smartphone, smartphone device and look for the application for uh, Pacific. And you can uh, download, download that on your device. And again, uh, you'll get news about uh, Pacific Station, uh, different crime tips, safety tips, uh, community concerns. Uh, you can uh, a voice on that. And also uh, a number of telephone contacts will be beneficial to, uh, to you when you're trying to reach out to the police or uh, get information and services. My LA 311 application. Uh, it's a handy, uh, it's another uh, smartphone download where you can uh, report non-emergency non situations such as uh, bulky item removal, uh, encampment issues, and also, uh, I said bulky items, uh, uh, graffiti removal. Finally, I was hoping to unveil this tonight, uh, but I understand it's not going to be till Friday. But for the Mar Vista community, uh, we're, we're establishing, and I say that's under construction, uh, the Mar Vista community at LAPD online. Uh, and that L LAPD uh, email address uh, will come straight into our uh, social media folks, and that'll be monitored uh, daily, uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, so, uh, and I would, I would caution you uh, really with whether it's next door or uh, uh, the Mar Vista community uh, email address. Uh, that's not a venue to report crime, and I'd be mindful also uh, when you're when you're using Nextdoor to not jump on uh, jump on the rumor mill. A lot of times we'll get reports of you know multi homicides and whatnot down at the Venice Beach, which are not true. But everybody will take a little piece of information, and then things like that can spread like wildfire and uh, cause uh, unnecessary uh, community angst and concern. So. With that, that, uh, that wraps up my portion of the presentation. I thank you all for listening. And I'm not sure who's next. Oh, sure. Thank you, Captain Setzer. Uh, they can take up the screen now. Uh, we're not going to get to the panel. I'm going to introduce now our moderator for the evening, uh, Jeff Mailman. Jeff is a former columnist for the Argonaut newspaper, uh, a current member of the Neighborhood Council of Westchester and Playa del Rey, a former member of the LAPD uh, Boosters and the Community Police Advisory Board, uh, and a frequent moderator and master of ceremonies of uh, all sorts of stuff in the, the southern part of the 11th District. Jeff, thank you very much. All right, um, I'm going to sit down if you don't mind here. It's going to be a little bit of a long night. Um, but tonight's town hall is meant to discuss the uh, current efforts to combat homelessness in Mar Vista, both city and county-wide agencies and leadership. And so I hope you'll uh, provide everybody with the opportunity to have their voices heard, both on the panel and from the audience. Um, I'm going to ask that everybody please be respectful of your neighbors and your speakers. Um, we know that this is a very passionate, uh, passionate issue, and we just want to make sure that we get the opportunity to hear from as many people as possible. Um, and Jeff, I think we gave you last week's script because yeah. you said homelessness. Oh, I'm that was last week. This one's public safety. All right. <laughs> ah, security. <laughs> uh, and so. Again, if you're interested in asking a question, I know a lot of you already have figured this out because I have a stack of cards here already. Uh, the first part of our program will be dedicated to collecting questions from the audience through the question cards that you saw at uh, the registration tables. Uh, there will also be a portion of the program in which attendees will have the opportunity to ask their own questions from the mic. Um, 
It's likely that not every question will be uh, answered just because of the time constraints. We have a number of questions that ask us things on similar topics. I'll try to group those together so that we end up uh, being most effective with our time. And um, if you leave your contact info with the folks at the front, Councilman Bonin's office will get back to you if you have a question that does not get answered this evening. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce all of our panelists this evening. Uh, we'll start with LAPD Senior Lead Officer Jennifer Muther, <laughs> District Attorney Steve Katz, <laughs> Deputy City Attorney Claudia Martin, Officer Chris Blankenship with West Traffic. Uh, Captain Brian Morrison. Commander Don Graham. Of course, Councilmember Bonin. Uh, Deputy Chief Justin Eisenberg. Commander Corey Palka. Captain James Setzer and Lieutenant Sam Rohn. We have a round of applause for all of our panelists. So thank you all for being here tonight. Um, let me start with a question that's really directed at the council member, uh, and I've got a number of questions that are related to this. Um, on any given shift, there are more than uh, 200 patrol cars on the street, but given the size of our city and the number of pedestrians and uh, hit and run crashes, property crime. Um, why aren't there more officers on the street today? Uh, so as I detailed in the opening presentation, uh, and thanks again, Jeff, for moderating, uh, there are more patrol officers on the street than there were two and a half years ago. And it's uh, probably the largest number uh, of officers LAPD has had dedicated to, to patrol uh, in quite some time. LA does have uh, one of the lowest ratios of uh, officers to people in, in square miles uh, for a major city because we are so spread out. Uh, but the size of LAPD right now at about 13,000 people, uh, a little over 10,000 of them sworn officers, the rest of them civilians, is about as large as LAPD has ever been. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, then Mayor Reardon uh, tried to expand the, the size of the LAPD. He had a goal to get to 12,000, uh, but he, like subsequent mayors, uh, discovered that uh, it was quite a challenge given that uh, of the city's discretionary budget, the money that isn't tied to specific grants for housing or some other purpose or environmental programs or something, 53% of it already goes to LAPD. And then when you add in LAFD, that's 69% of the city's discretionary budget. So the, the cornerstone of the strategy that myself and my colleague Jabuscaino, a former senior lead officer in the harbor area, uh, came up with was to try to figure out how LAPD can find more patrol resources with their uh, existing budget and or, or something close to it. And the most effective way to do that was to give them more resources for civilians so that the several hundred able-bodied officers who were confined to desk duty because there was necessary civilian work that had to be done would be redeployed back out onto the street. And as you saw in that initial presentation, Chief Moore's committed to doing more of that uh, as long as we on the City Council keep our commitment to allow them to, to hire more civilians. So that's the, the direction uh, we're moving in. Is there anything that the public can do uh, to, to help reinforce those efforts? Uh, yeah, I mean, when we get to the, the, the budget process, uh, there, you know, there's going to be tough choices to make, and, and supporting hiring more civilians uh, is an important one. Um, I would also say the public has done a, a great deal to help influence the basic car boundary study I mentioned in my initial presentation. Uh, they actually had to recirculate for public comment uh, the study because it was so heavily weighted to the west side uh, because we got so much feedback from the west side that it wasn't a, a proportionate snapshot of the city. But what happened in that process is that issues 
of particular concern to the west side for deployment were factored in to the, the study that will help the department determine patrol decisions for the next generation. And those kind of things are the, the impacts of, of traffic on deployment, the impacts of geographic isolation. You know, there's some communities on the west side that are uh, like Pacific Palisades, for instance, that are hard to, to get to. The impact of major resources like Venice Beach or LAX, which uh, are very resource uh, intensive and the impact that, that, that is a big factor here on the west side is you can't make a patrol decision based simply on the, the residential population of an area because the population of our part of town is twice as large during the day as it is during the evening because there are so many more jobs uh, than there are homes in, in, in this part of town. So all of those, because of the community input, are factored into this and that should help when the department uh, makes the decisions going forward. Can, can I add to that as well? Sure. Okay. So um, one of the cornerstones of the strategy of the Los Angeles Police Department under the, our former chief, Charlie Beck, and under the current chief, Mike Moore, is the idea of the community police partnership and how the synergy that's created when there's a really strong trust-based partnership between the police department um, and their community that they serve helps to maximize the patrol resources that are out there on the street. So for instance, you know, we hardly ever let a community meeting go by without talking about lock it, hide it, keep it, and getting the stuff out of your cars when you park them. Right? When I was the captain of North Hollywood Division, we averaged about 54 burglary from motor vehicles about every two weeks. All right, well, that's 54 times that a police officer would have to respond out, conduct an investigation, um, and then do all of the processing reporting that was required for that on a crime that is ultimately preventable if people would take better steps in that. And so I think the first step in that community police partnership is participating in Neighborhood Watch, having a relationship with your senior lead officer and listening to the crime updates and the trends that are out there and making better decisions in our own lives to make ourselves safer, to minimize the amount of time that police have to go to those kind of calls so they can maximize their time in dealing with the things that are truly threatening the community. Great. Uh, as we talk about the number of resources and the number of officers that we have uh, in the community and how we'd like to increase that, one of the things of, of concern is do they have the tools that are necessary to, to do the job? And one of the questions that we received was, uh, are all the vehicles in Pacific LAPD, uh, run, are they in running order? What amount of budget would it take to get them up and running? Um, I'm not sure who is the best person to answer that, but. I, I can kick that off a little bit. Uh, Terrific. You know, the, uh, we, Pacific does enjoy a dedicated garage uh, service uh, staff that oversees all of our vehicles. And uh, we have a very high uh, in-service rate. Uh, with, with rare exception, we have a vehicle that goes down for an extended period of time because we have mechanics on site. And so uh, that's, a, that's an adequately budgeted uh, uh, program that we have within the department and also maintaining all our vehicles in Pacific. And that includes all uh, beach vehicles, uh, the beach uh, off-road vehicles, and then obviously all of our patrol vehicles. Um, again, this is for whoever would like to answer on the panel. Um, the question is, why are the homeless who are obviously engaging in criminal activity, drugs, bike theft, um, being afforded the same tolerance as those homeless who are law-abiding? So I know that that might be the optic, but the police department... Well, can we... Can, the police can, department is committed to enforcing criminal statutes on people when they're observed. I think that some of the problem with the optic is that we believe that um, if we just report the narcotics activity to the police department, that we could go out and arrest people. Unfortunately, the possession of narcotics is a misdemeanor crime. And in the state of California, a police officer cannot make an arrest on a misdemeanor crime that did not occur in our presence. So that adds to the complication of that. Now let me get, and I know that I've actually read this question backstage and it talked about bike theft. So one of the issues that we're having with these folks that look like they're just collecting these bike parts, and we can all surmise what's happening, but from a legal standpoint, and I oversaw a bike takedown in my old division in North Hollywood, where we had 120 frames. And after four hours of running all of those frames through the system, not one of them came back as reported stolen. Not one of them even came back as registered. So at that point, we don't have a crime. 
And so that individual had to be FI'd and released, and we had to book 120 pieces of um, what turned out to be salvage at that point. So when you know that there's narcotics activity happening in a homeless encampment, if you're seeing it during a, time, a specific time of day, I encourage you to reach out to Pacific Division and give them as much information as you can so that Captain Setzer can send his narcotics unit in there and take the enforcement action that would be, that's necessary in the homeless encampment. So the uh, last year, there, uh, there was a 32% increase in the number of narcotics arrests that were made where the, where the suspect arrested was identified as homeless. The chief of police is committed to a services-led uh, enforcement strategy when it comes to crimes that are being committed because of the state of being of an individual. Things like sleeping on the sidewalk and the tent enforcement. But when it comes to other criminal statutes, if a homeless person is a drug dealer, they're a drug dealer, and we will take the appropriate action. What we need is we need the help from the community that knows that this activity is going on, that can direct our resources to the right place in the right time so we can develop a case and actually take this person into custody and have the case prosecuted. Great, Commander, thank you. Let me, let me add something to that. Uh, just want to chime in on that to the degree that uh, we are responsive to any kind of reports of illegal narcotics activity, uh, whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. Uh, even when we get a report of a, there's syringes at the, at the corner of walk and don't walk, uh, we notify our narcotics unit and they go out and they will follow up on that activity. And I know everybody is very familiar with Venice and Globe. Uh, that is a hub of narcotics activity and our narcotics unit has been working that area actively uh, for the past year. So uh, uh, we don't overlook it. Uh, as the commander said, uh, when we've got good tips and good leads uh, to work uh, criminal problems, we go after it. Great. Uh, this uh, came in a couple different ways. But I guess this is a question for the council member, and this is, do you support reallocating some of the funds that go to uh, criminalization and, and policing to things that address the root cause of crime, such as permanent supportive services and public health infrastructures? So before I, I, I answer, there's, there's a, for whoever's doing the, the sound, there's a big echo here on stage. So we're hearing an echo. Is the audience hearing the echo when we talk? <laughs> Mainly no, a little yes. It sounds like maybe the closest to the stage is hearing the echo. Um, so I'll try to enunciate. Uh, so the question was, do I support reprogramming of, I think it was, of existing uh, law enforcement? Taking police, police funds uh, that are currently addressed for, for police uh, expenses and folding them into education, employment programs, permanent supportive services, public health, things like that that address the root cause of crime. I, I wouldn't be supportive of, of, of taking money out of the uh, existing budget. Uh, there are still uh, uh, way too many neighborhoods in Los Angeles that, that, that need a quicker response when there's a burglary call uh, or, or need a quicker response when, when there's a 911 incident. Uh, what I am in favor of is using uh, a, a much smarter approach to, to the money we are, we are currently using. I think uh, generally, particularly when it comes to homelessness, the approach has been uh, too slow and too bureaucratic and we need a lot uh, uh, quicker and more nimble approach approaches. The city has a lot of very good programs. The city has launched uh, a program called LA Rise, which just kicked off uh, a couple years ago, the purpose of which is uh, to fill upcoming vacancies in the city, because several thousand city employees, everybody from library workers to sanitation workers are going to be retiring over the next several years, to fill them with people who are uh, seeking second chances, people who are formerly incarcerated, people who are formerly homeless. Uh, school board member Jackie Goldberg and Mayor Garcetti worked very hard on that program. That needs uh, additional resources. Um, and what we, we need significantly more of in terms of resources are uh, a lot of the county mental health funds. Um, the, the, the state and the county both have a significant resources of county mental health funds that, that need to be loosened up to provide more services on the streets so that when people under the, the criminal justice reform stuff that the voters have approved over the past decade are released from prison. Uh, they are afforded the, the services that voters were promised would be provided uh, for uh, uh, job training, substance abuse training, uh, to prevent people from uh, uh, falling back into criminal behavior and just repeating the cycle. So, so when we look at what's going on in the city today, we see uh, 
new development. And there's development fees that are associated with that that go to the city. Uh, Airbnb is, uh, is now being taxed. You've got the cannabis industry. Th these are new revenue streams that are coming into the city. Where are those dollars going? So different revenue streams. As I said earlier, the LAPD gets uh, the, the, the majority of the city's general fund. Most of the funds that, that, that you just enumerated, Jeff, are funds that were approved for a specific purpose, uh, either by voters or by law. So there are uh, development fees for affordable housing that have to go into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. There are development fees, frankly, only on the west side for uh, traffic impacts of developments that can only be spent on traffic traffic mitigations here on the west side, and they have been used to pay for uh, 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 left turn signals. For instance, I think we just turned on the left turn signal at uh, Venice and Sentinella today. Uh, that was paid for by, by, by some of those fees. Each of those fees, for the most part, has a, has a dedicated programming. The one that doesn't is the, 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 um, the, the, the cannabis sales, but in Los Angeles, as in much of California, cannabis revenue has not yet materialized in large part because uh, the, 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 the city has been too slow in processing the applications and in the other part because there are just too many damn uh, black market operations out there underselling the, the legal operators. Uh, and we're, we're now involving DWP to just shut off the power for the, the black market folks so we can uh, get them shut down quicker. Great. This question is for, uh, for Officer um, Muther. Um, is there a curfew at parks, specifically at Mar Vista Park, and how is that park curfew being enforced? Um, the curfew is from 5 in the morning. Maybe lean into the microphone. Oh, sorry. Just, sorry. The curfew is from 5 in the morning, so it opens at 5 and it closes at 10. And as far as it being enforced, uh, we do enforce it uh, as far as providing extra patrol, and we were working closely with Parks and Rec. Um, there was a little bit of an interruption. I don't know, as you all may know, they lost one of their uh, park rangers. So there was a little bit of a disconnect in, in that time frame. However, there is uh, park hours are open from 5 to 10 p.m. And they do have them posted throughout the park and in the parking lots as well. Great, thank you. Uh, this one's for, uh, for Captain Setzer. Uh, someone would like to know uh, what happened to the officer who was stabbed on Saturday and is he okay? Uh, I'm happy to report that he was not stabbed and uh, it's like uh, many rumors that get out there. Uh, uh, the officer uh, responded with his partner to a, uh, a battery of, uh, of, a, uh, of a restaurant employee down near uh, Washington and uh, Oceanfront Walk. The officers responded there. Uh, they make contact with the suspect. There's a foot pursuit. Uh, that officer did chase down the suspect. There was a minor use of force to get him into custody. Uh, gets him handcuffed, and I think through the exertion of that uh, particular situation and the uh, adrenaline uh, dump, uh, he, he blacked out. Uh, thankfully, he was okay, and it was after it was all over. Uh, he was transported up to uh, Santa Monica, and uh, all tests were negative, so uh, he's okay and definitely not stabbed. Great. That's it's, a, it's a, a good lesson for everybody not to believe everything you read on uh, next door, right? Thanks, Kevin. All right, this is for, uh, for Claudia, our uh, deputy city attorney. Um, is there anything that can be done about homeless encampments in alleys? Um, aren't alleys rights of way? Aren't the, uh, the homeless in danger or in danger of uh, injuring someone else or being hurt themselves uh, when they walk an alley? Um, yes, well, an alley is a roadway, so it is handled in the way where if there's items on any roadway, whether it's on Venice or Sentinella, right, is that the enforcement section. Um, with regards to how to handle the homeless encampment part, it, a lot of times the encampment could be in the alley, also could be in parts of the private property. So if it's on the private property, then sanitation, it's my understanding, won't go out to the private property to remove the items. Um, but if it's in the roadway, which that's what an alley is, then sanitation would go out and remove the items. Is that correct? So <clears throat> on October 1st, the Department of Sanitation greatly expanded um, its operations within the city um, in response to the rising homeless crisis. Um, and in place of the 12 teams that they normally had circulating throughout the city four days a week, they now have 30 teams five days a week going throughout the city 
um, and, and handling issues like that. And while um, the first month um, of operation that uh, the sanitation teams have gone out and done that. Um, there's been some discrepancies in the service level, um, and I know that the Department of Sanitation's management is taking a look at all of those and making sure that all of their folks are going out there and, and, uh, and living up to expectations. As far as the specifics of it being in the roadway, um, for a homeless encampment to actually be, um, to have them move and clean, um, would uh, requires a process um, that the city got involved in developing protocols because of a lawsuit that was levied against the city. Um, as uh, the city attorney said, that if the if part of the, uh, the cabinet is in, on private property, then unfortunately the Department of Sanitation doesn't have the authority to take the uh, property from that individual there, um, and that that's the responsibility of the the property owner. When it comes to that property, and the city again recently settled a lawsuit that we had um, that deals with property, and this has become one of the big deals in the, in, in the homeless crisis, is the entitlement of individuals to have and control their property, even in the public thoroughfare. Um, and although I know what the response is going to be when I say this, they, as long as a person maintains um, the ADA required amount of passable space, um, at least this is on a sidewalk, right, and their tent is not up, then they're in compliance with the current legal environment that we have. Um, and now, as far as an alley is concerned, I, I don't know the specifics, specifics of that alley, whether it was an enclosed alley, whether it's an open alley. If it's an open alley, then there should be enforcement of pedestrian in the roadway, plus the sanitation going out there and doing that piece. So I would leave that up to the command to answer about those specifics. But as far as just removing property from the public thoroughfare, unfortunately, because of the legal environment, it's not as easy as you would imagine it to be especially not for a police agency in, so that we can honor the Fourth Amendment um, about uh, unreasonable search and seizures of people's property. Uh, this next question is, uh, is a good one in the sense that uh, it, it looks at the issues that the homeless themselves face um, because they are a vulnerable population. And the question is, are undercover operations currently being used to discover the drug dealers who are selling to the homeless? Uh, yes. Uh, again, uh, with Venice and Globe, as you know, uh, many of you probably know, uh, you know, we did have two shootings in the past uh, probably year at Venice and Globe, one this calendar year and one last calendar year, and those had a direct nexus to uh, uh, narcotics use, and, uh, and it is a selling point and a buying point. And uh, as I mentioned earlier about uh, our narcotics unit, uh, they've been actively working that location as well as uh, we bring in other narcotics units to help us out also. So yes, to answer that question. Uh, this one's for Officer Blankenship. Um, the question is, is there a plan for more traffic enforcement within the neighborhood? I'm sorry, sir, could you repeat that? Yeah, is there a plan for more traffic enforcement within the neighborhood? Um, well, I currently work a uh, community traffic services unit. So in regards to more enforcement, if if there's uh, specific issues with a, a specific traffic um, issue, um, if that's brought to the, the unit's attention, um, that's our primary focus. We enforce that location as often as we can with the resources that we have. Uh, so if someone has a specific uh, issue, uh, problem that they have, they could address that with me later uh, with the limited time we have, and I can see about getting additional enforcement in that area. Uh, this, this perhaps was a question that was more uh, appropriate last week, uh, but I think it still applies, and that is what is being done about the public health risks at the various encampments? This one addresses uh, Rose Avenue in front of Penmar Golf Course, but it's a, it's a concern at many of these encampments. What is being done about the, the public health issues? So the, the uh, Commander Graham alluded to this a, a, a few minutes ago, but the different approach the, the city is taking to encampments. Uh, for uh, a very long time, the city grew sort of with, with mission creep and uh, an encampment cleanup process in Los Angeles that was uh, a, a tremendous 
uh, waste of money that uh, actually did nothing to uh, uh, clean up any encampments or address the public health crisis and actually caused a, a lot of harm to the process of trying to get people into service and as services and into a continuum of care. So uh, several months ago, the mayor uh, launched a new initiative. Uh, it's called the CARE uh, program as opposed to the, the HOPE team. Uh, and it's putting a public health approach first. So uh, the idea is to uh, provide uh, additional trash cans, as we uh, have seen, for instance, under the 405, uh, looking for more uh, trash cans to come there and at the location that has been uh, mentioned by the questioner. Uh, we are providing more uh, mobile showers and more um, uh, mobile restrooms so people have an alternative to defecating on the sidewalk or in the parkway or, or in the alleyway. Uh, the, the approach is about putting the, the public health treatment first, and we're relying on uh, and urging the county to provide uh, additional public health resources directly for uh, some of the care teams and for some of the encampments. Uh, this is a question interesting about uh, big data. Does LAPD use big data to predict crime? And where does uh, where's the crime come from? Is it being uh, committed by people who live in our neighborhood or people outside Mar Vista? Uh, what does the data say? I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but I will say this. Uh, daily, uh, we meet and discuss uh, the crime trends in the area, and we try to get an understanding of, of who the suspects are, who the victims are, and, and where the crime's occurring. And we base our daily mission, uh, whether it's a night mission or a, a daytime mission, uh, in those high crime areas. And we do try to understand, uh, you know, I know we have a number of uh, uh, transient-related aggravated assaults down near Venice Beach. And it is not uncommon for uh, some of those uh, crimes to be occurred by folks not from California. And uh, we, we work to identify those folks and, and make arrests where we can. Great. Thank you. There's a question about why LAPD officers are being contracted out to Metro when West Side neighborhoods uh, have a significant amount of crime to begin with. Who's setting those priorities? Uh, I, I'm probably the one to take that, I guess, as, a, as someone who voted on it twice as a member of the Metro Board and of, of the City Council. Uh, one of the things uh, that, that we found at, at LA Metro was that uh, the service that was uh, being provided by the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department was one that uh, very few people were, were satisfied with. Uh, some people felt that, that they weren't visible enough, and some people felt that they were uh, uh, too aggressive, particularly when it, it came to approaching uh, youth over, over fair events evasion issues. Uh, and so Metro actually went out and, and had other agencies uh, bid on it. So now the sheriff still has part of it, Long Beach PD has part of it, and LAPD has part of it. And uh, all of it is officers uh, working on overtime that is paid for by Metro. Uh, so the security detail that LAPD officers, uh, and you can, you can see officers frequently at the Expo Bundy Station, I do when, when I take it, are officers who are working for Metro uh, on overtime. And one of the, 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 the selling points to the city of Los Angeles of the system uh, is that uh, it got officers who are more familiar with neighborhoods working uh, at the stations in our neighborhoods. And it also had the ancillary effect of having more uniformed officers officers in our neighborhoods. The, the, the two officers that you might see uh, walking a beat at the Expo Bundy station, for instance, are two more officers in that, in that several block area than would have been there otherwise. So uh, from the city of Los Angeles perspective, it's a it's a win-win. Great. Uh, this is for Lieutenant Roan. Uh, the question is, how quickly are rape kits processed and what is the current backlog? Uh, all rapes that are handled in um, Pacific Division as well as West Bureau is handled by uh, our OWB sex unit. Um, regarding that information in terms of specific cases that are backlogged, um, they would be privy to that information. I currently don't have that information at this time. Okay. Um, how can the community be more supportive and inclusive to work to address public safety? More support, less arguing, it says. What was the last part of the question? It was, it was a comment that said, more support, less arguing. But the question is, how can the community be more supportive and inclusive to work to address public safety? I'll, I'll 
kick off. Uh, you know, the best thing you can do is uh, talk to any of these senior lead officers in the back of the room and uh, get involved uh, to be, in, uh, be involved whether it's block captain program, uh, volunteer programs at the station. Uh, we've so got I, can, I can get rid of this, uh, how do we start a neighborhood watch? That's the next question. Okay, oh, we'll probably, <laughs> I'll let, I'll let uh, Officer Muther uh, carry on with that one. But uh, it's, it's a matter of getting involved uh, and there's a number of programs. There's a, a community police academy. Uh, where you can uh, eventually work your way through that program and uh, get a, uh, a little uh, uniform of sorts and uh, you can ride around in a, uh, one of our hybrid vehicles and help us out there on patrol and actively work with another unit uh, to, uh, to help combat crime and, and observe crime in your neighborhood. So there's a number of resources available for that and for the neighborhood watch program I'll kick over to uh, Officer Muther. Yeah, if you want to start a neighborhood watch, um, I believe we left uh, five points of contact. Um, in the rear, it has all of the senior lead officers' information. Reach out to whoever is your senior lead in your area, and any one of us can send you information in regards to how to get your neighborhood watch group started. And I know I've reached out to, or a few of you have reached out to me, and I've helped you get started um, in the past. It's fairly easy. It sounds a lot more difficult than it is. Um, maybe just uh, hosting a couple meetings here and there and finding people in your neighborhood who are interested in ascertaining as much information to work with us um, and provide the public safety information that your neighborhood uh, is interested in. Great. I've got a number of questions here. I'll try to boil them down into uh, a similar theme. Uh, from a police standpoint, um, homeless criminal activity seems to be uh, increasing. Uh, increased burglaries, rampant bicycle theft, indecent exposure. Um, what can be done to make the public not only feel safer but eliminate some of these uh, these crimes that are being committed by the homeless um, home burglaries are there any numbers related to the frequency of these and where do we where do we stand it's, the public obviously feels as though there's been an uptick so I can tell you citywide, the, the, um, the crime numbers of uh, involving people identified as suspects who are homeless is up 30% over last year. Um, the uh, number of uh, victims identified as homeless in crimes is up 19% over last year. Uh, so in both of those categories, um, the real connectivity between the increase in homeless uh, crime across the city is the population. Uh, unfortunately, the city saw an increase in the homeless population last year, um, and it's led to a corresponding increase in the, in, in the crime rate. Um, ag again, to, to go back into the, the philosophy of the police department and the chief of police's commitment, um, the, when it comes to part one crimes and, and other crimes committed by people who are experiencing homelessness, their homeless status does not shield them from justice. And if we conduct an investigation and go out and determine that it was someone who was experiencing homelessness that was responsible for the part one crimes that you mentioned and others, then we will take the appropriate law enforcement action. Just like if we come across a person who is experiencing homeless, who was homelessness, who was a crime victim, we would expend the same resources to solve that crime and bring the perpetrator of that crime to justice. I defer to the captains for individual for Pacific Division. Okay, and with respect to uh, transient-related uh, crime uh, in Mar Vista specifically, uh, in 2019 we've had seven robberies uh, transient-related and 14 ADWs uh, transient-related and four burglaries that are transient-related. And those are all definitely up from last year. Does that mean there's more homeless in the area? Not necessarily because we're doing a lot better job at capturing that information, identifying that suspect as being transient or non-transient. Now with that, uh, how we work on that and how we focus uh, our efforts uh, if we consider the Venice and Globe uh, encampment and also the Pacific and Grandview encampments, within one block radius of each of those camp encampments, Venice and Globe particularly, there's been 30 transient-related crimes uh, year-to-date, and around Pacific and Grandview, 50 uh, transient-related crimes year-to-date. And uh, with the help of uh, Captain Morrison and whatnot, we've fielded uh, two Z cars that are, are for lack of a better word, a transient detail, and they keep the pressure, they, keep, they maintain identification of who's in these particular encampments. And it's not just a focus on uh, enforcement, uh, we also do try to uh, uh, find that balance of uh, extending uh, services through uh, service providers and trying to find those folks that are willing to uh, get out of that lifestyle. It, it, it's also worth noting that um, uh, numbers are up uh, in large part 
because homelessness is in increasing, uh, and numbers are up uh, in large part because it's data that the department recently started uh, uh, tracking more uh, regularly and uh, more, uh, more aggressively. Um, I think it's also worth noting, as, as we discuss this, though, uh, that um, the, 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 the social status of someone who is unhoused is one of the few uh, traits unrelated to the crime that gets mentioned with some regularity. Uh, we now have regular news reports uh, about, about crime being uh, committed by people who are, who are unhoused and, and news accounts refer to that as part of the story. Uh, that doesn't happen when there's a, a news account about a crime committed by somebody who is housed. Uh, and there are, it, it's just important to note that there are people who are homeless who commit crime and there are people who are housed who commit crime. And there are people who are uh, unhoused who don't commit crime and there are people who are housed who don't commit crime. And the vast majority of crime in Los Angeles is committed uh, presumably by people who are, 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 are housed. Um, and um, uh, you know, an, an example I, 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 I will give is, I guess it was over a year ago, I was reviewing some uh, crime reports for a weekend, and there were two different domestic uh, battery incidents over the course of a weekend uh, in Venice. Uh, one of them was in an encampment near the Ralph supermarket at, on Lincoln in California. The other one was uh, in a condo off Rose Avenue. I only heard about one of those on social media, uh, the, the 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 account by the account of the crime that involved somebody who was homeless became newsworthy. The account of a crime by somebody who was not homeless did not become newsworthy, and um, it, it 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 changes our perception of the reality out there. And when when you're calling 911, if someone's breaking into your home. It doesn't matter if, if they're sleeping in a mansion or they're sleeping in a condo or they're sleeping in a tent. Uh, a crime is a crime and needs to be treated as a crime and whether or not uh, uh, somebody is uh, housed or unhoused is irrelevant to the, the, to the crime itself. That's actually a nice transition to this. Uh, I have a couple questions on this. Uh, I called 911 today and no police ever came. Why not? Um, 911. 911 calls uh, sometimes get no response. Does that mean that we don't have enough patrols and we don't have enough officers? What, why, why would a 911 call go either unanswered or unresponded to? Well, I can't explain that and I don't know the circumstances. I mean, we can meet with you after this particular meeting. Uh, I, I'm at a, I would be at a loss to understand why a call would get dropped. I know it could happen. I know during the fires and whatnot a week and a half ago, uh, we definitely had some uh, interruptions to service. And uh, I do apologize for that today, but we can certainly have uh, one of the officers meet with you after this meeting to find out what that crime was. So I, I can speak to that also. Within Pacific Division, there's a couple things that go on with regards to response time to calls. So that you understand the picture, and we do keep stats of this, our average response time to a Code 3 call, which is an emergency call for service, there's a crime in progress, is about 6.9 minutes. Um, it's slightly higher than city average, and our response time uh, to code two calls, which are priority calls, um, but that's not lights and sirens, is running around 23 minutes. Where we are particularly challenged is our non-coded calls. So that's the 877 ask LAPD line, or if you're referred from a 911 operator over to a non-emergency operator. And where we're challenged there is we're looking at about 75 minute response time. And there's a lot of factors that play into that. Uh, the geography within Pacific Division is challenging to get from one end of the division to the other. Um, we're, we're driving around a lot of physical boundaries. So for instance, if you were, uh, let's say, up off of uh, Pacific and Windward, and you suddenly had to get down to Playa Vista by Dockweiler, uh, you are going to be substantially challenged, as I'm sure all of you are aware, driving through the division. So. We monitor that stuff, we keep an eye on it. Uh, that's feedback that Captain Setzer and I would like to hear um, to kind of track where that call may have gotten dropped or how it got triaged. Uh, we need that feedback. 
But generally speaking, when you call into 911, uh, officers will respond. A 911 response is <coughs> tracked by communications division, and that call does not go away until we have responded officers physically shown up to your location. So we can talk offline about that specific problem if somebody wants to come up and, and speak to me that had that incident. Great, thank you. Uh, we have time for two more questions before we transition, and you can see I still have quite a number of questions that won't get answered, but when we go to the open mic, I invite you to come and address those questions. Uh, this question is from a police officer's perspective. What percentage of people sleeping on the street in West LA do you believe have a substance abuse problem or a mental health problem? Are you a police officer, sir? Let's ask the officers. Well, the official point in time count data that's provided by the Los Angeles Housing, uh, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority says that 21% of the population of the county of Los Angeles is either suffering from mental illness or substance abuse. On the Los Angeles Police Department, we don't keep those specific stats on, 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 on folks. Um, I can tell you from a correlation standpoint, um, when I was the captain of North Hollywood Division, um, in 2014, we did um, 470 5150 involuntary mental health holds. In 19, or I'm sorry, in 2018, we did 970. Um, so there has certainly been an increase if the North Hollywood Division is, a, uh, is an indicator. Um, I don't know what specifically those things are in, in Pacific Division, but um, there is certainly a rise in the responses for mental illness. Whether or not it's correlated to homelessness, I don't think I'm qualified to say that. Um, and I know that there are folks out there that shout their opinions, um, but we don't keep those individual statistics. I, I can all elaborate on that uh, a, a bit because I think uh, there, there are some of you I think who uh, uh, scoffed. I can't see your eyes, but I'm sure rolled your eyes when you when you heard the stat about uh, the numbers from the, the, the point in time count, uh, given how widely uh, different they were from the numbers that were reported by the the LA Times uh, analysis. Uh, those numbers are are very very different. Uh, and they're very, very different for a number of reasons, one of which is that they, they analyzed different data. On the question of, of mental health, for instance, uh, the, uh, the, the LASA numbers refer to, as it must, because it's a federal uh, uh, method they have to use, refers to the federal definition of somebody currently experiencing a mental health situation, whereas the LA Times analysis and, and even the UCLA study that was somewhat related and nationwide uh, refers more to whether or not somebody has ever had an experience uh, with a mental health issue in their life. So that's why the, the numbers are that they are. The, the real number I suspect is somewhere in between, um, but um, I, 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 I mention this because uh, often what we have heard, and we talked about this a little bit last week, is that uh, if the issue really is that more people are suffering from a, a, a drug addiction or, or, or a mental illness, the, the solution should be a different one. Uh, and elected officials should stop talking about this as being a housing issue. Um, the, the reality is twofold. There are many people who fell into homelessness because of addiction and mental illness, and there are many people who fell into addiction and mental illness because of homelessness. Uh, but regardless of, of what got them there, what, what was the chicken and what was the egg, the, the solution still requires homelessness as part of the intervention. You can give somebody mental health treatment, you can give somebody drug rehab treatment, uh, but if, if they are taking their medication or if they are off drugs and they are still on the street, they are still homeless. And so housing still needs to be part of the solution. Uh, and the, the, the housing solution that actually a lot of people object to because of the, the, the cost of it, uh, supportive housing with wraparound services is exactly the type of solution that is needed for people who are suffering from a mental health issue because that's the way to address both issues simultaneously. And then our, our final question from the cards is, uh, what are you doing to contain costs? Uh, have you explored electric cars, better computer usage, uh, working at operations to reduce unnecessary functions? LAPD costs? 
Yes. I guess that's you. I, I'll touch on that in the extent that uh, we are, uh, as a department, moving towards uh, electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles, uh, but that is a slow march, and uh, you know, a lot of those vehicles are not really suited to 24-hour uh, patrol service, uh, but for administrative use, uh, some of our detective follow-up, uh, we are using uh, uh, the BMW uh, i3s, I believe, and then also uh, the, the fleet is slowly being changed on the detective side of the house to, uh, to move towards uh, hybrid vehicles in terms of being more fuel efficient. So. I can speak to that. Good. Well, <clears throat> and also the, the chief of police is committed to, uh, to exploring technology as a force multiplier for the department and for an efficiency ga uh, gainer. Um, the, uh, his goal is to cut down the amount of time that police officers have to stay in the station for administrative functions by 50% so they can spend more time in the streets providing service that they need to. And so uh, those technology fixes would cut down on um, not just the administrative uh, portion of how we do our job, but it will speed up dispatch, it will improve communications between units, it will improve communications between the public and the department. Uh, and so we're, uh, we're looking uh, for um, not just the city support, but um, other uh, ways to finance uh, increases in that technology piece. Um, a recent uh, efficiency decision that was made by the department is the shutdown of uh, front desks. Um, during uh, specific hours when it was noted that the telephone and foot traffic into the stations um, was a fraction of what it is during the day. And so that put 72 police officers around the city back into patrol cars um, just by, by shutting that down. So we are looking for innovative ways to utilize um, our resources. Captain Setzer talked earlier about volunteering um, at the station. Uh, there are many ways that, uh, that the community can assist a police station to run more efficiently so they could push more police, sources, police resources, again, back out in the street to provide the service that you need as a community. Great. Thank you very much. I think now we're going to translate uh, the questions from me asking from your cards to you asking directly from the open mic. Um, I would ask when you come up to please remember that you only have 30 seconds to ask questions. We want to give everybody an opportunity uh, to speak and also to be mindful that there's less commentary and more asking of the question. I think uh, we're going to stop you if you're, if you're just uh, commenting and, and you don't have a question there. So, and, and let's uh, see if we can turn up the lights too so we can see yeah, the folks who are asking questions. There we go. Hey, everybody. This is about bicycles, scooters, and other alternate means of, of transportation. Uh, the bicycle riders, for the most part, are scofflaws. Is there anything that is being done or being planned to be done to have them uh, apprehended, ticketed, doing something to stop the danger, in particular, because of the, uh, the road diet on, on uh, Venice Boulevard, there have been numerous accidents. And finally, do we really need to have the road diet in view of the fact that most of the bicycles have been stolen? Mo <laughs> most of the bicyclists are what? Stealth stolen. robbed, yes. Fewer bicycles robbed, yes. Or stolen. <laughs> Uh, so, on, on the questions of the behavior of bicyclists, uh, th there's a phenomenon in, 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 in Los Angeles and other places that I refer to as mode rage, is that everybody is really pissed off about every, every other form of transportation they happen not to be using at the moment. Uh, so if you're in a car, you're annoyed by buses and cyclists. If you're on a cycle, you are, you're annoyed by, by cars and buses. Uh, if you're in a bus, you're, you're annoyed by cars, and, and that is a phenomenon that is universal. Are there cyclists who sometimes uh, 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 don't obey rules of the road? Yes. Uh, are there motorists who often don't obey rules of the road? Yes. And when the motorists do it, they're driving a huge piece of machinery that, that, that can kill people. Uh, so everybody needs to, to, to do better with rules of the road. In terms of the, the, the broader question about um, what, what's called multimodal infrastructure, which is uh, making sure that we are a city that is better uh, for all forms of transportation, uh, that's something we absolutely need to do 
as, as a matter of climate change, we cannot continue to be a city that relies solely on single uh, occupancy vehicles. Uh, we need uh, more neighborhood shuttles, like we've started in the, in the Mar Vista Venice area, like uh, uh, LA Now. Uh, we need a better sidewalks so it's safer to walk. We need safer intersections. We need more bicycle infrastructure, and we need more bus rapid transit. Uh, we need to be doing all of that all around the city, uh, and this was a first step in that direction, and we need to keep doing more. How about a little bit of enforcement of the laws for bicyclists? So, I, I, I speak to that real quick. So, uh, I've lived in the city of LA since 1974. I have become a hood ornament three times as a, an avid cyclist. Um, two of those were vehicles that turned into me, and one was another vehicle that merged into me. And uh, being on a 17-pound bike going up against a 3,000-pound car, the laws of physics are not in my favor. So we, we monitor both and we enforce both. Part of that enforcement strategy is cyclists need to be responsible and respect the rules of the road just as we expect vehicles to respect the rules of the road. And it's a common courtesy on both sides. From an enforcement standpoint, especially in a heavily congested area, it's very difficult for officers a lot of times to cite cyclists, scooters, other moving conveyances other than a traditional vehicle because we cannot get caught up to them. That's where uh, we work with our partners uh, in our traffic division and utilize motor task force in combination with our bicycle officers to go out there and write tickets and take enforcement action against uh, those that normally would be difficult to stop, such as bicycles and scooters. And we have done that successfully uh, several times in Pacific Division, especially over the summer months. Uh, traffic Division has come out and provided that support to us. So we are aware of the problem. We take that enforcement action. But those bike lanes are there for a reason, for the safety of the cyclist and the, the portion of the public that chooses to use them. And we need to work together, as the council member said, uh, because there are a lot of different ways people get around this city. Hi, I'm Robert Watkins uh, from Mar Vista. Captain Setzer, you referred to uh, a lot of the, excuse me, Setzer? The, uh, you referred to a lot of the homeless population around Venice Beach being from out of state. And I've spoken to a lot of LAPD and officers on the west side who have confirmed a similar finding that most of the people we see on the street in our neighborhoods are actually from out of state. Do you have an estimate as to what proportion that is of the people in West LA? I'm not talking about downtown LA and statistics for the whole state. I'm talking about West LA, the people that you guys confront on the street doing drugs and selling drugs. What proportion is from, are from out of state? You know, I, I don't have that number. Uh, I don't even have an estimate of that, quite frankly. But I know over the summertime, uh, we had one particular week where we had uh, about eight aggravated assaults down at Venice Beach, and six of those were committed by people from Florida, Texas, and you know, other parts. Right. So it's not uncommon. I don't think it's as big a number as maybe a uh, rumor might have you believe. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the climate in Southern California is nice, and so we do attract a number of folks from uh, out of state. Thank you. Um, Captain Setzer, you talked about the infamous Globe and Venice encampment. That's where I live. I'm on the front line. I'm just down the street, just down the alley, and it is the most unsafe situation I've ever seen in my life. As you mentioned, there's been two shootings in less than a year. Psychotic episodes on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. Um, I've been chased in my car by a hostile encampment member. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't outrun him. My husband's life has been threatened twice. The last one happened this past weekend. I've done everything that you've said. I call the cops incessantly. I've written emails to most of the people sitting up there on the stage. My question for you is what else can be done? Because I don't see a way out of this. And I'm genuinely concerned that someone is going to die, whether it's someone under the encampment, in the encampment, or someone living in the community. Well, we are. Uh, <laughs> as uh, your area commanding officer, uh, me and uh, Captain Morrison, and really everybody here at this table, is certainly concerned about your public safety. And it has been, I mean, those shootings and the, the, the criminal activity, in particular the narcotics activity at Venison Globe, uh, is significant. And we know that that impacts the entire uh, neighborhood uh, within at least a block radius, if not more, because of the, the transitory nature of the folks that come in and out of that particular encampment. 
Uh, Camp Morrison's been instrumental in uh, orchestrating a number of uh, efforts to uh, to work with even Culver City and the California Highway Patrol. I mean, we brought in we brought in partners into this operation that uh, have not really joined up with us before to uh, to uh, raise an impact and uh, keep a, a steady pressure. Like I said, we've uh, got two two full time uh, two officer uh, transient cars that get in there, and we've tried to identify those folks. I know working with Claudia Martin, we've got service providers in there. Uh, I believe it's St. Joseph's that gets in on uh, Tuesdays. I think we're still doing the Tuesday cleanups, and or, you know, we're trying to do the best we can to impact that area. And we have put a significant number of resources in there, and we've had we've had marginal success, to be to be frank. And uh, we continue. And I am so sorry for for the way you and that neighborhood is feeling right now. But it is a constant effort and a focus from us to try to bring as much resources as we can to bear on on that particular problem. And then if I can add, if, if I can add something, I do remember the first incident was on a Thursday in August around 10 p.m. is when we got the email. And just um, as a side, obviously our dedication to public safety, you and I were in communication at from 10 to 11 p.m. And in addition to that, the captains, all three of us were in communication. And by the next morning, we were speaking because we are dedicated to public safety. And we were trying to figure out what exactly happened during that call, which we discussed right on that Friday. So we do, obviously, we understand what the community is going through. And, you know, we, like I said, we are very much, everybody here at this table is dedicated to the public safety. And when there is something, someone is arrested, the case will either go to the district attorney's office or it will go to our office where we vigorously fight and get stay away probation conditions. And maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about, um, you know, with the services, a lot of things comes out that folks are have mental, you know, mental health issues, drug addiction, where what we're trying to do is in addition to the services that are being offered in the field is if someone is arrested and we know about it, obviously we know about it, but if we know that they have a history of it, then what we do is offer them the services when they are in custody. And one of the things that we've done is just last week, October 30th, is we brought in the service providers to meet with our fellow public defenders, the judges, the DA's office. We were all together in a room so that the, the service providers from LASA, St. Joseph Center, PATH, everybody from the west side, so that when the public defender's clients, which are the suspects and our defendants, right? So one person can be a client, the suspect, our, def our defendants, they can be given the information as to where to go. So they're in addition in the street, they're given the info, this is where you can go get services. And then when they're arrested in court, we try to make it a part of their probation so that they have to come to court, report back to the, to the judge, and we try to give them services in addition to ordering a stay away, which protects the community. Because this type of reaction is, protects the community, but also we're trying to provide the services for this individual so that it's not a cycle where they just go right back to your corner or go back to your corner or somewhere else. So that's something that we are doing. But we do, like I said, as soon as you said the, the nighttime, we knew exactly um, the phone call and the situation we're trying to, to help out. So I want to ask a, a follow-up of, of Claudia and, and, and perhaps the, the district attorney as, as well, because um, I, I think, although it's not what we're saying, I think that, that people often hear that and interpret that, you know, our, our, our response with, with services as, see, they're homeless, so they get to get away with crime. They get to get away with threatening my life or, or intimidating me. And that, that 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 I know is not what you're saying. Um, that there's a that there's a there's a two pronged approach. We want to eliminate the root cause of the issue, but we also want to to, to prosecute uh, any any crime that we have sufficient evidence of of of, of something that has been a, a, a death threat or, or, or something that has been a, a, an actual crime of something being uh, a stolen or, or, or somebody being uh, assaulted or anything like that. So what, I, what I, I'd like to ask, I think people need to, to hear this a little bit more from, from us, is in the, the kind of situations that we're hearing, we hear a lot about the, 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 the bike chop shops, uh, we hear a lot about the, the, the unfortunate situation that, 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 that she was just describing. We, we talked about what the, the, the test was to, to get a conviction or a charge on a bike. 
nobody's registering, nobody's reporting. In this case, she has reported. What is the, the type of, of evidence or activity that is needed in a situation like this? And it's typical of some others for you or the DEA's office to be able to bring something to trial. So in a, this particular instance, what happened in August, we figured out what the issue was as to when the individual was there and then called and screaming and yelling, the officers removed the, the situation, right? Removed the individual. For a public, for a threat, a criminal threat, a public uh, penal code section 422, there has to be obviously a threat. The individual, the victim, has to be afraid, and the individual, the suspect, has to uh, likelihood to be able to carry out the threat. So all those things need to be included. A lot of times, what we see when we go to community meetings is when folks um, encounter the situation and they call 911. They don't necessarily end up meet, talking to the officers. They want the situation gone. They want the individual removed. So, but in order for us to file the victim the person has to come forward, give a statement to the officers, and be willing to come in to testify. And then we have that in the report, and we can file a case. But we need to get a report from the officers, and then, like I said, in a statement from the individuals. Well, what had happened in that situation is we spoke to the officers. Is this okay? Can I? <laughs> and um, they said that we had to file a restraining order and then he would have to be served that, but that was really difficult to do with an encampment situation, so it's very difficult. Hi, it was recently reported that nearly 1,000 Metro bikes have been stolen, mostly by the homeless, and each of those bikes cost $2,000 a piece. Also, 40% of HHH money went to soft money. This is money waste, taxpayer dollars being wasted by our leaders. How can we trust that you will best help us out of these situations with the homeless? My second question is, we have scooters running amok that we cannot see at night. I am concerned for their safety as well as mine. Why can we not require that they have better tax, license, registration, insurance, and better lighting? If my car is required to have a third light for safety, they should have more than one LED light two inches from the pavement that I need to see before I possibly run them over. Uh, so the scooters, we are going to be putting more restrictions in place. It's, uh, uh, I think we're about three months away from the end of the pilot, and then new uh, uh, rules will go into place, uh, much likely much, much stricter. Uh, in fact, the general manager of the Department of, in of Transportation about two weeks ago issued a cease and desist order against one of the companies for not complying with some of the rules we have laid out. So uh, they're appealing it, but they're going get, to get, get booted out of Los Angeles, and there'll be, be, be more to come on that. Uh, in terms of the Triple H dollars, I'm not sure exactly what you define as soft costs versus the hard costs. What I do know is that um, we have made allocations of Triple H dollars that will uh, result in 8,700 units uh, of housing. Uh, that is significant. Several hundred of them are going to be here on the west side. Uh, and the average city uh, financial commitment to each of those uh, is, is less than $150,000 uh, from, from, from the city. A lot of projects have, have various sources behind them. I think the, the important thing to remember, though, because a lot of talk gets made about Triple H and about the cost of permanent supportive housing, is that type of housing, that type of intervention, is for 20 to 25 percent of the homeless population. Permanent supportive housing is the, the, the proven, effective, and in the long run, financially prudent, saving money, approach to dealing with chronic homelessness. That's people who have been homeless for a long time, they have a disability or a mental illness. It is not the solution that we need for 75% of the people who are homeless, people who have recently become homeless, um, who can be housed a lot uh, cheaper and more quickly, which is why I'm advocating shared housing and master leasing and, and a number of other things. So we have to push on a whole bunch of strategies. That's only one of them, but it actually is. The, the investments are starting to pay off on that. And the bicycles that are being stolen? 
Uh, on the bicycles, I saw some news report about uh, metro bikes being stolen. There's all sorts of bikes being stolen. The metro ones are probably easier for us to prosecute because uh, they actually do have uh, registration numbers. Uh, so those might be a little bit easier. Uh, but we certainly can't stop uh, doing anything that that the city uh, or metro does uh, because it may be something that gets stolen. Um, uh, if, if that were the case, you know, we, we'd stop having uh, cars in a lot of our neighborhoods with this car thefts, uh, or we'd, we'd stop having, uh, you know, iPhones because a lot of them get stolen out of people's vehicles. Uh, a, a crime against a particular thing is not a reason to not have that thing, and that is a, 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 a demand that the public has asked for that we're satisfying. Hi, I'm Joe Doherty. I'm from Palms. I was recently on jury duty at the airport courthouse in a DUI case, and fully half of the jury panel that I was on was excused for cause because they do not trust the police. How can we have public safety? What's your plan for public safety when your partners in public safety, the people here, a significant percentage of them don't trust you? Thank you. Who is the question for? Literally all of you, the prosecutors, the police, the, the politicians. I'll, I'll give you guys time to, to think, well, and I'll, I'll go first if, if, if you want. Uh, for, for, for me, one of the answers takes me back to, to the, the beginning of, of, of the evening and the presentation on, on neighborhood policing. Uh, every time there has been a significant movement in Los Angeles for uh, police reform, uh, it has been about neighborhood policing. It was the, the, the call after the, uh, the, the, the Watts riots. It was the, the, the call after the civil unrest of 1992. It was the call uh, after Rampart. Uh, 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 civil rights leaders uh, across the board all called for an increase in neighborhood policing because they wanted to have uh, better relationships between uh, neighborhoods and law enforcement, where people actually know each other's names and personally know each other's neighborhood. Uh, that is a, that, that's, that's key and fundamental here in Los Angeles. I know there are, there, there are some folks who want who actually call for abolition of, of the police department. Uh, that's not something the majority of Los Angeles, the majority of this district, uh, uh, would, would ever want to see. Uh, we need to improve relationships. Uh, community policing, big part of it. In various parts of the city, uh, in a couple of my colleagues' districts where they've had uh, chronic gang issues, they've had very effective uh, community safety partnerships uh, in Watts in, in particular. Uh, and um, you know, I, I think that um, that, that is an important cornerstone of it. The other thing I think is important, and, and, I, and I don't think this is particular to uh, law enforcement, uh, is I think the, the move towards implicit bias training um, is important for everybody. I think it's important for elected officials. I think it's important for, for, for city employees. I think it's Im important really for anybody to be trained uh, on implicit bias. And if people know that that's happening, uh, I think that that will give them a, a better sense of trust with their law enforcement partners. Anybody want to? Yeah, I'll just say um, every day Los Angeles police officers do hundreds of thousands of acts of kindness and trustworthiness. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, sent out or uh, put out through through the media and, and many events. And I'd strongly encourage, like the councilman says, to build a relationship. These stations are open literally 20 hours a day in most cases. In the command I came from, 24 hours. You are always welcome into a police station. We have open house. There's social media platforms that constantly invite you, the community, to participate in the events where we exhibit trustworthiness, where we show you data that you can challenge um, to try to have a relationship with you. And I know how busy you guys are and the lives you lead in this densely populated community. And the hope is that you can find some time to get into a station and to know you're slow and many of you on a personal, a personal basis to build that relationship. And with the relationship, like the councilman says, comes the building of trust. And, and it begins by one handshake at a time, one cup of coffee at a time. So thank you for the question. A friend of my mother who lives in Beverly Hills recently had a homeless man who had fallen asleep in front of her lawn. When the police arrived, they did not arrest him, but they had uh, instead told him to move a couple miles to the city of Los Angeles where he could sleep as he pleases. Specifically for Mike Bonin, is there anything you would be willing to help with enforcement, uh, to legislate enforcement to better uh, the city of Los Angeles? 
the, the, I, I heard the part about Beverly Hills pushing people into Los Angeles. What was the, the question part? Uh, is there any legislation that you'd be willing to uh, help pass to uh, better the police uh, in the city of Los Angeles? Well, that's a question of, that's a different police force you're talking about. That's Beverly Hills. No, no, but wait. I, I think what, what, he's, what he's asking, Mike, is, is, is there something that the city could do to keep that from happening, to keep other jurisdictions from pushing their homeless issue into the city of Los Angeles? Well, yeah, first I should, I should probably say that that, that, that does not surprise me um, that, that, that Beverly Hills does that. A number of smaller cities we've heard anecdotally do, uh, and uh, Beverly Hills has objected to many things, including uh, a subway going through their city, uh, underneath their school. Um, Beverly Hills, first of all, I think under some uh, new state action that is happening that, that the region weighed in on yesterday, Beverly Hills is now going to have to step up and, and do their own damn share of providing housing and affordable housing. Uh, Beverly Hills has to do a hell of a lot more. Um, uh, I, I, I would also uh, support anything uh, within the, those housing mandates uh, that require uh, smaller, more affluent cities like Beverly Hills to have to provide their share of homeless housing. Historically, what has happened is because Los Angeles is a very big city with a relatively large treasury, people have sued Los Angeles and required us to do things that we should be doing but that our neighborhood, neighboring cities, which are smaller, have not been sued over, so they are not compelled to do the right thing the same way we are. And they're doubly taking advantage of it by pushing stuff into our cities. So I've asked our city attorney uh, in the past to look into whether or not there's any litigation we can bring, uh, and I have encouraged some of the groups that have uh, brought cases against the city of Los Angeles for not doing enough for housing, affordable housing, homeless housing, homeless services, uh, to do the same to the smaller cities. Thank you. Hi, yeah, this is for uh, Council Member Bonin. Um, yeah, I thought you helpfully and pretty articulately talked about how some of the major issues facing the unhoused communities are, uh, you know, things like mental health issues, addiction, literally not having a place to sleep or go to the bathroom, that these things are not helpfully addressed by uh, criminalization and policing, and in fact are often exacerbated by being thrown into the criminal justice system. And you also mentioned how um, our, the, the LAPD's budget is over 50% of the discretionary budget. So given all this, given the enormity of the homelessness crisis and the fact that um, permanent supportive housing is costly, do you support reallocating funds from the LAPD's budget to support public health infrastructure and actual housing and things that are going to help our unhoused neighbors? I appreciate the question and I appreciate the, the impulse. No, I do not support taking money out of LAPD's budget for those purposes. I support the state and the county doing more of their share to provide those services to the city of Los Angeles. Cities in the state of California do not do health care do not do social services. That is the state and the county's responsibility. And rather than lobbying to take money away from an agency that most of my constituents are, are asking for more resources for, um, we need to be pressuring together the county and the state to provide the resources that exist so they actually get here and are spent the way they need to be. You, you agree that criminalization exacerbates the problem? I do. And arresting that. people who are impoverished is going to keep them from getting the services they need. You do agree with that. So you do agree that spending money on policing and criminalization is going to make right. things worse. Is that right? I just I, want to clarify. I, 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 do, I, I, I do agree that criminalization has actually made homelessness worse. I agree that criminalization has actually got Los Angeles into the, the, the hands tied behind its back situation that it's in. Um, where, where I disagree with the analysis, even from people that I, I, gen, I generally, generally agree with, is that if LAPD stopped uh, uh, doing any enforcement of, 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 of some of the ordinances that are referred to as criminalization, that doesn't mean that those officers go away. Those are officers who can then respond more promptly to the calls that we keep getting about the person who said, I called 911 last night for, for, for a home invasion robbery and they didn't get there for half an hour or I called 911 uh, la last night because of, uh, you know, th there was somebody trespassing through my backyard. I mean, th those resources, whether it's sanitation or LAPD, that are sometimes 
diverted into responding, I think, inappropriately to homelessness, still need to be used for their primary purpose. Hi there. Um, so my question is about, it's directed to all of you, it's about what are you doing to help your unhoused constituents? Because a lot of what we see from the police is harassment, throwing away unhoused people's belongings, putting them in jail, putting them on the streets even longer. And so my question is, what are you doing to protect your unhoused residents when 900 unhoused people in Los Angeles are going to die on the streets this year, either because they have nowhere to sleep, nowhere to eat, or people are attacking them because of violent rhetoric such as this? Who, who was the question for? Everyone. OK, um, I'll, I'll, I'll lead off since I'm sitting in the middle and you're, you're making eye contact with me. Uh, for my part, I'm trying to build uh, as, as much damn housing, as much damn shelter, get as many services uh, as possible in the city of Los Angeles and try to uh, break sort of the religious fervor that uh, the bureaucracy has towards one particular solution to homelessness when, when we know it's very clear that we need a, a myriad and a range of solutions to homelessness. Uh, so it, it's something I'm talking about everywhere I go, whether it's talking to neighbors or talking to uh, state and, and, and federal officials and, and, and something I'll continue to do. And I'm very appreciative of anybody who comes out in support of whatever solution it is. We, we, have, a, we have enough of a homeless crisis with a diverse enough population and diverse enough needs that, that, that there is room for almost any solution to homelessness, whether it is a permanent supportive housing or shared housing or increased mental health services uh, or safe parking or, or, or safe camping or whatever. We need advocates for each of those because there's not enough advocates for most of those solutions. Hi, um, I, I live um, one block from the intersection of Venice and Centinella, specifically one block to the west of Venice and one block to the south on Pacific Avenue. I just want to quickly state I've had two incidences where I've reached out directly to a patrol officer and their response has been fantastic and instant and just amazing, so thank you. The question I have has to do with how encampments and where encampments are, this might not be the right word, allowed to form. On my side of Venice, there are it's a series of encampments in front of a strip mall and in front of a Starbucks, and these are allowed to grow in size and in length, and I understand dropping tents and width, and I'm all for that. But I also see encampments start to form on the north side of Venice, and somehow where the blocks, the sidewalks are longer, those are kind of clear, and there'll be a place, somebody there for a day or two. And can we, can we get to the questions? So why are encampments allowed to establish on one side of the street and not the other. Okay, thank you. So I, I don't think it's a matter of uh, allowing or condoning or anything like that. I think you have an unhoused population that moves into an available space, and it's how that interaction occurs within the community that includes both housed and unhoused. Uh, for us, um, we only deal with the regulation of criminal activity. So. To be homeless is not a crime in and of itself. And I think we need to have a clear distinction about that. So if there is enforceable activity uh, that's criminal in nature, then LAPD gets involved and we target that. And so I think sometimes what you see in a rise and fall in encampments is when we remove a criminal element, which oftentimes can uh, be driving that encampment because some of that population is vulnerable and exposed to that criminal activity. If we move some of those primary individuals out, um, then you may see an encampment disappear. Other encampments may maintain themselves um, due to a relative level of compliance with ADA access and different things like that. So it's a, it's a complex issue. I can assure you, though, it's not a matter of allowing, defining, or saying this is an acceptable space, this is not an acceptable space. I, th I think the population finds itself in certain areas uh, simply because it may be a safe place to sleep for a night, and then someone else finds that as a safe place to sleep for a night. Um, and, and that's kind of the genesis of how those things come about. 
Hello. Um, on January 11th, 2019, Mike Bonin, you were quoted by The Hollywood Reporter. You quoted, or you were quoted, and this is a direct quote from that story, I cannot accept the idea that there's an inextricable link between crime and homelessness. It's wrong, it's not backed up by the data, and it leads to bad policy. The NBC Streets of Shame segment that aired two nights ago in concert with the officers flanking you this evening are telling a different story. Crime involving homelessness is up over 30% this year. NBC reported it's up over 50%. I'd like to know if you still think that there is no inextricable link between homelessness and crime, and if you do believe still that there's no link, I want you to turn to the officers to your right and tell them that there's no link. So let me be clear. An inextricable link means that things cannot be separated. If there is an inextricable link between homelessness and crime, that means you cannot be homeless and not be a criminal. I, I believe that most people who are homeless are not criminals. I believe that most people who are housed are not criminals. I, I, I do not believe that the state of being unhoused means you are a criminal or are predisposed to criminal behavior. The officers, I think, on your right and to your left, their data shows different numbers and you should have directed that to them. And if their data is wrong, you should have You're suggesting them. that their data shows that everybody who is homeless is a criminal. There That's what inextricably linked means. That is not what our data shows. Okay. Next question, please. Next question is, it's in the same vein, so to piggyback off of that, my question is, why is it so many officers the past year. I, I live in Venice. I, I live near the pier. I I've, have had to be put in situations where I've had to call LAPD on numerous occasions, being threatened with my toddler walking down the street mid-afternoon. Every time an officer shows up, and they're, they're pretty quick and they're really polite, but I will tell you, Councilman Bonin, every single one of those officers has said to my face and explicitly and directed, directed it towards you, said, I can't do anything. You need to talk to Councilman Bonin because he will not let me do anything. And if you yeah. talked... Yeah. Do, and, do, you, do you have a question? So I... What, what's your question? Do you have the My, name? Do you have the name no, of any I, single what? officer? Do you have the name of any single officer who has ever said that I told them not to enforce a law? I do. I will not turn them in. I don't want them to lose their job. But they will tell me, they've told my neighbors, they've told everyone who has called. They've explicitly named you and also Mayor Garcetti. But really you? as tying their hands when it comes to enforcing laws that the rest of us have to follow. I can't camp on the beach yeah. with my son. I can't lie in the middle of the street with my stuff. I can't walk down the street and yell at someone and say, I'm going to kill you All and right. your child. I'll it, be arrested. It would, it would it'd be helpful if everybody continue to just ask the question and move on. We, we have a number of people who have questions. And, and just I'll, ask the question and move on. And I'll be very clear. I said it again. I do not think homelessness is a crime. I think if somebody who is homeless commits a crime, they should be arrested and they should be prosecuted, period. I have never asked an officer to not enforce a law against someone who has committed a crime. And I'll go further to say that if an officer disregarded a command from their chain of command and listened to an elected official instead and took orders from an elected official, that would be grounds for, for discipline because it would be insubordinate. Yeah, I would just like to add real quick that uh, Councilman Bonin has not sent me any directive to not enforce uh, any laws. So I know that there's a certain amount of frustration with some of the constraints we have when it comes to enforcing the laws, but it's not driven by the Councilman. Hi, my name is Jim Doherty. I live in Palms. Uh, my question is, are public park 
is being opened up for overnight parking for people who uh, don't have homes, and are the bathrooms in those public parks being opened up for those people? I I'm sorry, the echo is really bad. I, I heard the last part about opening up public bathrooms. What was the first part? Are the parking lots being opened up for those who are parking overnight uh, to sleep in their cars? Yeah, so I, I believe we need to dramatically expand the safe parking program in Los Angeles. Um, I, I was the first person in Los Angeles to push for safe parking. I've been pushing for it for a, a very long time. Uh, it finally started a little over a year ago. We have uh, uh, 10 or 20 spots at one of my offices, about 10 spots at another one of my offices. Uh, we have been looking for churches and businesses to allow us to, to, to do more. Uh, and a couple of my neighborhood councils, the Delray Neighborhood Council in particular, are, are looking for more slots. Uh, there is uh, some money from the state that is available for safe parking, uh, and we need to do a lot more of it. Um, I'm, I'm not ready to, to open up all the bathrooms at all of our, our, our rec centers 24-7. Uh, even people who have been part of the, uh, the, 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 the coalition of organizations on the west side that have asked for more bathrooms have, 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 have pleaded with us that they come with attendance to keep them clean and safe. Uh, so we have been doing the, the pit stop mobile toilet program. Uh, I'd like to see us do more of that, but um, I don't know that, that opening up every park after curfew hours are closed uh, and staffing all of those is going to be the most effective way to do it. I think we need to figure out where the largest concentrations of encampments are and provide uh, more sanitary facilities there. Next question. I have been victimized severely by crime, which includes severe criminal complex identity theft. I have registered with the Victims' Compensation Government Claims Board. What do we, as victims of crime, have to do to receive our relocation award from the Victims' Compensation Government Claims Board, also from living in the Manchester Square area? I was promised over $20,000 for living in the Manchester Square area as a relocation award. I have not received it. And I'm actually the daughter of a deceased Tuskegee Airman whose picture information was displayed at LAX when the 12 by 60 foot mural was there. My father's name is Lieutenant John Lewis Hamilton. He's in several museums. He's in books, documentaries. Right. My brother also worked for 77th Division Police Department. His name is James Hamilton. He is deceased now. So what do we have to do as victims of crime to receive our relocation awards? So at Pacific Division, there, we do have a victim advocate. So what we can do after the meeting, um, we can take your information and then I can refer it to him and then I can get some more information from you as well with regards to exactly what fund you're talking about. If it's Because you've said victim of a crime and also because Manchester Square, they did relocation. So we have to figure out what funding you're talking about, but we can talk afterwards and then we can help direct you where you need both. to go. Both. Both. Then we will get you both information afterwards. All right, I just want to remind everybody we have about 10 minutes left, so. Right there. Um, in the interest of public safety and transparency, uh, Councilman Bond and I sent some questions to your office about 30 days ago regarding the mobile showers at Venice and Globe. So I'd like to know if you are committing to transparency and we'll have those questions answered. So far they've gone unanswered upon multiple requests, about probably 10, 15 follow-ups. My question for, actually I'm not sure who it actually goes to, is is there anything being done to fix this $950 limit that's tying your hands to be able to prosecute arrest. You mentioned that you know it's a misdemeanor under $950. Is there anything being done to fix that so that these crimes that people are taking and stealing and, and all of that under 950 bucks can't be arrested? All right, thank you. So do you thank commit you. to transparency and is that being fixed? Those are my questions. Thank you. So what was the transparency question, Chris? I asked a number of questions of your office on October 17th, and they've been refused to be answered so far. So I'm happy to send them over to you tomorrow morning if you want to answer them. That'd be great. No, my, my office has received them. We we have you know 40 or 50 thousand people in Venice. 
many of them also want questions answered. We've gotten a volume from you repeatedly, uh, and we also have to respond to, to some others as well, so we're, we're, we're trying to, to do that as well. Sorry, as the, for the, the, answer, uh, the answer to me was that they wouldn't be answered in writing, which I've asked so that it would be clear. So it's not that they wouldn't be answered, they just wouldn't be sent to me in writing. So I would appreciate the commitment to transparency to answer the questions. I answered the question. Uh, what was the second question? No, Oh, the, the second question, um, uh, I'm sure Captain Morrison can take it too, but a, a quick answer on, on 47. Uh, there's always a, a, a lot of debate about 47 and, and the, the criminal justice reform initiatives. Uh, what, what I'll just say is there is a ballot question next November uh, uh, that, that makes some adjustments to that. Uh, I haven't read it yet. I have no idea if it's a, a good or a bad thing. I'm sure it will be vigorously discussed throughout the next year. Uh, and I suspect that it is going to be, the, the approach towards criminal justice is going to be the hot and defining issue in the district attorney's race. Hey, I'll just throw in there real quick that uh, regardless of the amount of money involved uh, when we're looking at the felony and uh, misdemeanor threshold, we still pursue the crime because if we get the conviction, we still get the stay away order. First, I wanted to thank somebody who decided to allow pedestrians to start across the street first before traffic starts. Because I, so many times before that happened, I just about run somebody over because they're looking at their phone, and I start around the corner and they go, and I just about run them over. So whoever decided to let them go first, thank you. <laughs> Second of all, I looked at adding ADU to my property, and uh, the costs I understand are like two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars when you add the cost of the loan and the cost of insurance and the increased cost of property taxes, it just becomes prohibitive. Now, I l started looking in my neighborhood at the new, const new construction. My house is 98 years old. I think the construction's pretty darn good because it's lasted that long. My, my roof beams are two by fours this far apart. They have two sir, by eight. Sir, what's your question? <laughs> Can we have somebody from the engineering department at UCLA or somewhere else evaluate the construction costs now and see if we can come up with some reasonable construction so people can afford it? Uh, yeah, so there are a couple of points to that for those who, who, who couldn't hear it. The, the, the first part of the question was about uh, accessory dwelling units, uh, which uh, is under state and city law, is now something that most homes can do. They can do what used to be called a granny flat. Uh, he was asking first about the costs of it. Um, the, the county has done some cost reductions in unincorporated areas. Mayor Garcetti has also been pushing some cost reductions here in Los Angeles. Uh, there's a little bit of information about it on his website. Uh, under the homelessness section, it can, it'll get you to the ADU section, uh, but also uh, Ariane from my staff, um, who's, who's right there in your eyesight to your right, um, can get your contact info and a member of my planning team can connect with you and, and help you out a little bit. Good evening. Um, I have a question. You may have heard that there was a child who was um, assaulted by a homeless person in Westchester over the last few days who I understand has been arrested. Um, my question is, I reported that individual to Alasa per your staff's request that there were, he was residing on private property in the Westchester area in September. The response I got was five weeks later that there was no ability to do anything. So my first question, and I don't know if this is for Claudia, but what as members of the community can we do to push these things forward because now as a result there's been an assault on a child from someone who is clearly mentally has a mental issue and was not assisted. So I'll let uh, LAPD or Claudia talk about the the, the, the case. So with regards to this individual I don't know if you said it, but I'm assuming you're talking about in Westchester, right? Yes. Okay. Um, this individual, actually, we've been working closely with your senior lead officer, Castaneda, regarding this individual and working with the other providers to try to figure out what code section, and this is before the, the incident with the child, would apply in the circumstances. Unfortunately, this individual did um, do an attack on a, uh, on a child, and so that case is being reviewed by the district attorney's office and then also by our office as well to see if there are any criminal charges that we can file. 
I mean, he attacked a child. That's, so my second, my follow-up question is that on that, and this maybe is for the councilman, is, you know, this was reported to LASA. Who is holding LASA accountable for, I mean, we report these things, and it, it appears that nothing is happening. It, it, it's, I don't know that that's I'm accurate, not familiar with the particulars, so it's hard to tell what, what other than what was reported to LASA. That there were, it was part of a report that there were three homeless individuals living on private property in the Westchester area. And could they get out? And I will say I would thank Officer Pinnell, who immediately sent out his homeless team to uh, address this issue. But LASA, I got a report six weeks later saying, it was a form letter, essentially, saying that they couldn't do anything. There was so no a, as for the trespassing, that would be a criminal matter, so I, that I wouldn't know about. That would be L LAPD or, 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 or Claudia. In terms of what outreach LASA may have done uh, or what services they may have offered and what this person's response may be, LASA isn't legally allowed to, to share that information with me, so I wouldn't know the, the particulars of it, if, if particularly if it's a, 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 a health or mental health related issue, federal privacy law prevents them from giving me any details. There's many times we try to get more info, but they, 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 they're not allowed to share well, it. But that's taxpayer dollars, so LASA needs to be accountable right. to somebody. So I'm All right, we, we only have about who are they accountable to? Yeah, we only have about five minutes left, so I want to get as many people the opportunity to speak as possible. Our next question, please. I want to bring to your attention two things that are happening in our community. This is for the LAPD officers. I want to know if you're aware of this and what you're doing about it. The first, people are feeling unsafe walking. I know specifically of a stakeholder who had a shopping cart pushed at her by someone who was homeless. And um, now she's afraid to walk in the neighborhood. The second thing that I see happening is more and more people are going down to the homeless encampments to re retrieve their stolen property. And I'm wondering if you're aware of that and what you're going to do. Because my concern is that there's going to be some kind of incident between people in the encampment and people coming to get their stuff. And I would like to not see that happen. I'd like to see some prevention. Uh, with respect to taking matters into your own hand and uh, collecting your own property back, I would suggest uh, calling 911 and request uh, the police to meet you and uh, kind of get a background on that information and let the police uh, uh, sort that out because that is uh, putting yourself in harm's way potentially. Uh, with respect to being unsafe or feeling unsafe walking on the street, uh, one should be mindful of uh, uh, like anywhere, wherever you're walking in the city, a major city, uh, you know, be mindful of your surroundings. And I know that there, there's a certain uh, uh, angst when it comes to uh, walking around some of the homeless folks, uh, but it's, it's a matter of awareness and uh, understanding your surroundings and uh, being mindful of uh, where you're at. Um, hello, good evening. Um, earlier, someone talked about that the majority of the public doesn't trust our police force. So my question is, what are you doing to make sure that you make your other officers accountable for the murders they commit all across the county? Because in 2016, The Guardian reported that black residents make up 9% of the population, but represented 24% of deaths in the county. And even back in 2015, Chief District Attorney Lacey refused to prosecute one of the officers that Chief Beck had recommended to be prosecuted for shooting an unarmed black man in Venice. So what are you doing to make sure that we do not feel unsafe around our own police officers because they can use excessive force against us? Thank you. Did you well, want to do a response from the DA? I'll go ahead and kick it off. Uh, you know, uh, again, uh, Jim Setzer, I've been on about 25 years, and uh, the department has gone through leaps and bounds of outreach to uh, create an air of uh, transparency between the police and the communities. And I think one of the biggest uh, assets we now have, and the community has really, to, to enjoy and, un and understand the trust uh, factor and transparency is body-worn video. Uh, there, there's a running uh, live uh, video uh, inside the police cars and, and on the officers and their contacts with everyone. So, uh, you know, I mean, I, th I think uh, there's just not many departments and certainly no major department that I know of, uh, of this size uh, that, that enjoys that kind of transparency to, to where we're recording every contact. 
Well, Kanena, can we, can we keep all the questions to the microphone? Next question, please. This, this question is for Council Member Bonin. Uh, there was an earlier question before about soft costs, and you weren't aware of what those were regarding uh, the Triple H money. I'm surprised about that because you're pretty well informed about the homeless uh, crisis. Um, so I'm reading, I'm disseminating from an article in my hand. 11% is land costs, 49% is hard costs, you know, uh, uh, foundation, roof, and anything in the middle, and 40% are soft costs. My question is this, soft costs are, can be financing, uh, developers fees, etc. Are you interested in authoring the council file so that those costs can be eliminated or greatly reduced so that money can go towards land and building so the advocates behind me can see more housing for homeless people and, and not have these encampments? That's my question. I, I, I'm sorry because the echo is so bad. I, I missed a lot are of it. You, I know it's about soft costs. Would I sponsor a council motion? Are you do? interested in, in sponsoring a council file, council motion, that will greatly reduce those soft costs so more of the money from Triple H can go into l buying land and building material to build the housing for the homeless instead of these arbitrarily soft costs that we can inflate and, 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 and it sucks most of the money out of the Triple H, out of the Triple H fund. It sucks 40% of it. So I'm trying to, re I want to know if you're interested in reducing that to say zero with a council file. So I, I apologize because it's, it's, it's really hard to hear with the, the, the acoustics, but I would be supportive of, of any number of efforts to try to uh, reduce the costs of the, the housing that is being built with Triple H dollars or, or any other dollars. I should say that I think part of the, the, the problem with the costs is that uh, in, in part because of the, the federal tax structure, uh, we, we have a very poor system of financing affordable housing. Uh, it, is, it is a complex, convoluted, uh, opaque system that relies on multiple funding sources, tax incentives, and private development. I think that the time has come where we would be much better off if we started doing uh, more e either master leasing where we rent the units and then have control of it and can move people in, or if we started moving towards more of a, a social housing approach as they've done in, in some European cities, uh, which is a variation on publicly owned housing. Um, and I'm, I'm sure my staff is going to kill me for doing this, but, but the, I, I, need, I need to say one thing about the, the, the last question. Um, uh, I, I made a point earlier in this meeting of saying that it was not fair to suggest or imply that uh, everybody or the majority of people who are homeless are criminals. There are some who've done bad things and they should be arrested. Uh, I think it is only fair to say the same thing about law enforcement officers. Uh, we, 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 we should not uh, villainize and demonize any class of people. There are some amazing officers who save lives every day. Uh, are there some officers who have done some bad shit? Yeah, and if they have, they should be prosecuted. But I, 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 I want to be very clear, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, uh, support or endorse the demonization of, of, of everybody who's homeless or, or everybody who wears a badge. And I think it's, it's fair to have the, the, the same standard for everybody. Great. We are now at 9 o'clock, so this will be our last question. Uh, hi. Uh, Mike, this question is for you. The Union Rescue Mission has built a sprung structure to shelter 100, 120 persons and this shelter is costing 1.7 million. Uh, everything is with private money or private donors. What is the cost of the sprung structure on Sunset, the, a, bill, a bridge home that is currently being built on Sunset? And how many people are going to be housed there? Uh, at the bridge housing on, uh, in, in Venice at Maine and Sunset, uh, the, the overall population, the overall number of beds is 154. That's 100 adults, uh, and it is uh, 54 youth. But I want to be very clear, it's not 154 people. It's 154 beds. And the goal of this housing is to 
have those beds serve several people during the course of the year and move them in and move them out. And it's one of the reasons I'm trying to, to put shared housing in there so those folks can be moved out quickly. Uh, I would like to see us be able through that facility to, to house several hundred people throughout the course of the year. And what the is the cost of the structure? I'm sorry? What is the cost of the project? I, I don't know offhand, but I can get you the info. It's seven million. The, we, th that, that, no, that is not the cost of the sprung structure. It's there, seven there, million. There, there, there are, of the there, there are co there, I'm sorry ma'am, there's costs of the, the tent, there are costs of the trailers, uh, there are also costs that were uh, spent uh, defending against the litigation against the project. There are infrastructure costs to do to the water hookup, so th that is not the, the cost of the tent. I don't know the cost of it offhand, but that's not correct. Great. Thank, thank I want to thank all the members of the public who came out tonight. I'd also like to thank Council Member Bonin as well as our representatives from the District Attorney's Office, the City Attorney's Office, and of course the uh, LAPD. Um, we are now sort of finished with our panel discussion. I know Councilman Bonin has a closing yeah. remark or two. Okay, that surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it says in my notes, Councilman. Uh, I, I just, one, one, let me thank everybody, thank Jeff for moderating, let me thank everybody on, on the panel for being a part of this, thank everybody here for coming. Um, whether it is the conversation we had primarily about homelessness last week or the conversation that we're having primarily about public safety this week, um, these are uh, not easy problems uh, and they are not things that have black and white solutions. Uh, particularly when it comes to homelessness, uh, there, there are so many shades of gray because there are so many types of homelessness that require so many different solutions, so many different strategies and, and so many interventions. Uh, I appreciate those of you who have taken time to get past uh, sort of the, the, the noise of social media to uh, to engage uh, more in depth on the issues, and I appreciate that. Uh, and I would encourage folks, as I did a little bit earlier today, uh, to, um, uh, to, to, to take, and I say this to the service providers as well, uh, an ecumenical approach to addressing homelessness. For a very long time, everybody has put their eggs into one basket, saying there is one solution to homelessness. And this service provider fought with this service provider, fought with this neighborhood leader, but with this elected official. Um, there is no one religion when it comes to solving homelessness. We need very, very many different strategies, different types of housing, different types of services tailored to the individual needs uh, of, of the person who uh, is in trauma and needs to be rehoused. And so there are not a lot of voices out there for the solutions other than permanent supportive housing. There's a lot of good voices out there for permanent supportive housing, and I appreciate them. But we need more voices out there uh, for, for safe parking, for shared housing, uh, for master leasing, for any of the other quicker and nimbler interventions. Um, it's not enough to, to be against a solution you don't like. We really, really encourage folks to engage in favor of a solution that, that you do support so we can do them all. Thank you very much.